Okay, good morning, everyone, or evening, depending on where you are. I'm Tomasz Wolinski, and I'm a product and marketing manager at Art Elements, and I'll be taking you, taking you through this webinar today. So, and we are going to dive a little bit deeper into what does sector coverage actually mean. And at our developments, we provide innovative solutions for a modern day WISP. Still, today, the biggest problem of unlicensed WISP networks is the interference caused by using the gear that's either poorly designed and or just deployed without any regard to sustainability, which is connected to the R of noise produced by these devices. If, if only a few people produce noise, it might be not a big deal. But it, if everyone starts to produce noise, well, eventually everyone will suffer because of that. And at RF Elements, we address the problem of noise by changing the paradigm of fixed wireless industry. We're setting new industry standards for RF performance, noise rejection, and system scalability through our award-winning horn antenna technology with Twistport ecosystem. And before we dive into the topic, let me just remind you, if you have any questions during or after the webinar, feel free to type them down into, into the questions part of the webinar tool, and we will get to answer them at the end of the webinar. And they don't necessarily need to be related exactly to the topic. And for those who are watching this uh, webinar on, on Facebook Live, uh, again, I will get to your questions in the comments after the webinar is over. So these are two images showing the same scenario, but the one on the left is, is an overlay of an antenna beam width on, on a map, a simple graphical representation of the beam width. And this blue area is not coverage. It simply shows you the, the section of a circle corresponding to the antenna beam width angle on a map, but nothing more, really. The image on the right, though, is the closest thing to how coverage uh, would look like if the electromagnetic waves were visible. So while the electromagnetic waves uh, don't have any color, in order to visualize something, obviously we must use a color. And in this case, the, the more vibrant the red color is, the stronger the signal gets. And vice versa, the fainter it is, the weaker the signal and in uh, the lower right corner, you can, you can see the scale of the signal strength, indicating that the strongest signal is minus 45 dBm and the weakest one at minus 95 dBm. And obviously, there are other things coming into the calculation. So just for the reference, we mentioned these details in the lower left corner. But before we go into the details of the coverage, it's useful to to look at a few misconceptions about what wireless network operators may or may not think coverage is or is not, which we'll have a look in, at in the, in the following slides. So many users understand that the coverage of an area is defined by the beam width of an antenna they use. And this is simply not true. There is a vague connection between them Yes, but they are not the same thing, actually not even close. It is important to be clear about this fact because some antenna manufacturers use beam width in place of the coverage to give a simple answer to a rather complex question of what coverage an antenna provides actually is. And understanding this can, can help you better design and debug your networks when needed. Usual way to visualize the coverage is to plot that pizza slice shaped area where the beam width uh, angle determines the angular width of the coverage. The, the gain of an antenna the, and again decides how far the coverage reaches. So inside this area, we have a signal uh, with a good coverage and the outside of it, we do not. Simple and clear, right? But this is a huge oversimplification of what coverage really is. 
The reality is that the various link calculators uh, show some signal strength, even if you place the client device outside the area that is supposedly covered. Well, how can that be? Something doesn't add up here. Then. Obviously, there must be some sort of a mismatch between what is shown and the reality. And the coverage is not a digital variable. That is a value of one inside the blue area and zero everywhere else. So if the beam width does not define coverage, um, what is it then? And what is it good for? So beam width is an antenna parameter. And it's defined by the decrease of an antenna gain from the bore side by some value. In the WISP industry, uh, this value is either minus three or more commonly minus six decibels. And these numbers are based on historically accepted standard. But as such, they are really an arbitrary choice. And they're closely tied with the maximum gain uh, rather than anything else and help you get get you an idea what expected shape of the radiation pattern may be. The beam width is a useful information for antenna alignment. With a very narrow beam width antenna, I mean, one must be very precise when aligning the, a point-to-point -point link because even a small deviation can have a strong effect on the link performance. And this includes the mounting of the antenna. Narrow beam with antennas should have sturdy mount that should be able to withstand windy conditions because even a small misalignment can throw the link off completely. Although generally there is no strictly a definition of a point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint antenna, the beam width is a good indicator of what application an antenna might be better for. And distant narrow sectors are possible with narrow beam width antennas, but because the higher gains come with the comes with the narrow beam width, high gain antennas are most used in point-to-point -point lengths to simply squeeze every possible length of distance from a link. In antenna textbooks, you can find the minus three dB beam width um, with angle marks, uh, so where, where the angle marks so-called crossover point of two sectors, uh, which is a point where the coverage areas of two sectors need to overlap to ensure a proper functioning of a network. But as with any textbook parameter, it depends on the type of application. If it is useful for WISP industry, the usefulness of the crossover point is negligible due to the unregulated nature of the WISP networks in unlicensed bands that are most commonly used. So I've shown you a short teaser in the first slides. Now that we know uh, the beam width is just a very crude and inaccurate measure of the coverage. Let's now have a look at what it really is. So there are many parameters that go into, into visualizing coverage. Now, first, the site, it has a certain height above the ground, radio output power, and the antenna has specific radiation pattern and down tilt and orientation in the space. And then we need the map data to have enough precision and the information how the access point is oriented in the map. Now, we, knowing all these parameters, we can project the fields radiated from the antenna onto the map surface. And that is coverage. Now you can see that there is no limit to where you have coverage or you don't. It shows you how the signal strength changes with distance. And it has a continuous and smooth decay until the signal strength is below the radio noise floor, which obviously sets the limit to the distance until which it makes sense to display the coverage at all. And the precision of the coverage calculation is limited by the precision of all the input variables just mentioned. There are also some factors which are difficult to count in, like changing weather conditions or changing foliage on the trees with the, with the season. 
A good example of coverage visualization is provided by a, the visible light, you know, which is also an electromagnetic wave, just like the 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz RF signals, except at much, much higher frequencies. Now, the circular spotlight on the ground, um, which is the light is pointed at, is, is the coverage. And the flashlight is the quote-unquote antenna in this case. Now, except the visible light, electromagnetic waves are invisible, which makes the visualization of the coverage by RF signal more obscure, let's say. What we can do, though, is to visualize RF coverage using a pseudo color. Now, we assign the strongest signal a certain color. In this case, it's red. And the weaker the signal gets, the more transparent it is. In this example, we use a 30-degree symmetrical horn. Now, the dashed line indicates the 30-degree beam width as my, at minus 6 decibels, and I'm sure it is clear by now um, why the signal reaches beyond these lines. The coverage is a measure of the whole three-dimensional radiation pattern and all the other variables measured earlier. And you can see there is a no clear border between the area with and the area without the signal. It is a continuous and smooth function of the radiation pattern. So for human eye, the single color plot with degrees of transparency is actually not an easiest thing to discern. Yeah? It's hard to actually read the signal uh, strength at any point. Now, to make this plot more useful in practical life, we, we can use more than just one color. So the same plot when using five colors instead of just one looks like this. And now it's much easier to say where the signal is, let's say minus 70 that's dBm and where it's minus 45 dBm, for example. So the colors help our eyes to quickly estimate the signal strength and can be where, what signal strength we can expect and where. But we, go, we can go even further than that. If on top of the the access point output power and the, the gain of the receiving antenna, we also know the channel width uh, that was used and the noise floor level. We can still improve the practical utility of this plot. These are MCS isosurfaces, MCS levels or rates, however you want to name them. So here, each color determines what is the span of MCS rates the link can work with. Now, this plot gives you an immediate visual information on what MCS rate you can expect depending on the location of the customer. And now you understand all those cases when setting up a link and maybe wondered, well, how come you can see the access point which you should not see based on the, based on the beam width of an antenna you used? Now, it is clear now that using the beam width as the coverage approximation is really inaccurate and very often misleading. It is important to understand that all antennas out there function in a similar way. The coverage is basically elliptically uh, shaped area, such as the one shown, uh, but of course differing depending on the, on the shape of the radiation pattern. So going further, we prepared a few examples of commonly used antennas in WISP industry to, to illustrate how the coverage looks based on the real physics-based data and simulation. So let's start with the sector antennas. The traditional sector antenna has a wide radiation pattern. And unsurprisingly, the coverage is not determined by the beam width. And you can also see the back radiation and the side lobes that cause all the issues with collocation of these antennas very clearly. And in hope of mitigating the collocations issues, many WISPs turn to all kinds of shields installed to the backs of these antennas. Now, while a shield might dampen the back radiation a little bit, you see what it does to the rest of the radiation pattern. Its shape ends up being rather rather wild, potentially making your life more difficult because the customers who were close to the edges of the sector can now find themselves out of it and their, and their service deteriorating with it. And the shields are simply not a good idea when trying to deal with noise. Because, for example, in, 
In this case, the back radiation did not really change much, and the main lobe has changed substantially. The iron filament symmetrical horns have no side lobes, which you can clearly see at this plot. Just a nice pill-shaped beam pointing forward. And let me emphasize again, these plots are, are not images someone created in Photoshop, but real physics-based simulation of the path loss uh, with particular setup, which is really the closest thing to, to the reality you can get. Now, same goes for the asymmetrical horns. Here is the coverage when using the 90 degree asymmetrical horn. And again, any antenna would give similar result. There are multiple MCS zones with the beam width angle and, and the signal goes beyond this angle as well. And similar images, of course, can be produced for point-to-point -point antennas, which we will show, it, it will actually reveal even more obviously that the coverage is much more um, than the beam width alone. So among all directional antennas, uh, parabolic dish antenna is the most common one used in WISP industry. And here you can see how the coverage looks like using this particular dish. Now, besides the substantial differences between the polarizations in terms of the side lobes and undesired coverage, you can see that there is a lot happening outside the manufacturer declared five degrees beam width, uh, further confirming that the coverage of an antenna uh, goes way beyond the beam width definition alone. Now, looking at the real coverage plot, more can be said about any antenna out there. In this case, the directional patch ray, uh, patch ray side lobes are very clear, as well as the chain misbalance. Now, each of the polarizations has quite different coverage shape. And again, this is an undesirable feature uh, for, for the antennas used for sectorial or point-to-point -point coverage. An optimized design of RF elements ultra dishes um, helped minimize the side lobes to a large degree. But the physics of the dish antennas dictate that the side lobes are very hard to avoid completely. Nevertheless, our ultra dish is optimized for, for minimum side lobes. And here is the ultra horn, no side lobes whatsoever, just a single beam and that's it. It behaves in a similar manner as, as that flashlight example shown previously, providing a very clean coverage with no side lobes creating unwanted coverage areas. Moreover, its performance is identical in both polarizations, which is the reason why we only show one plot actually. The coverage is identical for both the horizontal and vertical polarizations. The plots on the previous slides are showing only a static image of the coverage, meaning this, these are the coverages at a single frequency point. And if we calculate the coverage at many frequencies and make an animation of these images, we can see how the coverage changes with frequency which is very important information for WISPs, since you use a quite wide chunk of the spectrum. Therefore, the antenna performance, in this case, their coverage, should be ideally stable over the whole bandwidth as well. Now, seeing this animation might not surprise you because you probably experienced it in practice where by switching the channels, hoping to use the cleaner bit of the spectrum you see on the spectral graph, the result seems even worse, leaving you sort of scratching your head. Now, this is exactly what happens when you are changing channels. The radiation pattern is changing a lot with the frequency causing the fluctuations and ultimately unreliability of your network and the services you're providing. And this is unfortunately the property of the patchery antennas based on their physics. This is what we mean when uh, we say that the coverage is not stable or reliable. Yeah? The frequency dependence of the radiation pattern makes the user experience anything but satisfying. And your life as a WISP constantly busy servicing the links that change whenever you switch the channels. Now, this is how RF elements patch sector performs. 
Now, the coverage fluctuates somewhat as well, as you can see, but overall, it is much more stable than with most antennas of comparable type. Now, visualizing the coverage like this really tells you the story of what a stable coverage should look like. And even more so with our horn antennas. Now, if our patch array sector was stable, horns are super stable. Now, within the useful spectrum, the coverage is virtually unchanging, which is what you want from, from any sector or directional antenna. This way, you can rely on its performance and provide the headache-free service to your customers, which really is a dream of every WISP, yeah? because if you don't get those complaints from your customers, then your life becomes easier as well. So symmetrical horn is um, a very different case from anything else. It provides extremely stable coverage within the legal spectrum. Now, this is the great advantage of horns as a type of an antenna, their stability. But don't get fooled, not all the horns are that stable. The horn can be designed for such stability, but still it takes a considerable effort to actually achieve it. And down tilt is another functionality of RF element horns, unlike any patch or antenna. And from the following slides, you will, you will understand why. So down tilt is a huge factor influencing the coverage area, at least with the patch array sector antennas or any other antenna with a very narrow radiation pattern in the elevation plane. It's really about the shape of the main beam. Now, from this animation, you can see that the, anything beyond a few degrees of down tilt makes the patch array pretty much useless. In other words, you lose the coverage almost completely. And this is a disadvantage of that very narrow radiation pattern in the elevation plane and why the traditional sectors require very precise setup of the down tilt. They're very sensitive to even small deviations. You can see that anything beyond a few degrees really makes the coverage disappear. Asymmetrical horns have a strong advantage of gradual shrinking of the coverage with precise uh, or with increasing the down tilt while retaining the shape of the coverage area. So this smooth coverage area shrinking with, uh, with the down tilt increasing from zero to 25 degrees of down tilt is yet another tool or added functionality in your hand, which can help you mitigate the noise your radio sees and respond to changing customer base as you go, depending on the where, obviously where the furthest customer is located. Now with symmetrical horns, the effect of down tilt um, is also a totally different game compared to patch race sectors. So progressively increasing the down tilt, you can see just a gradual and smooth shrinking of the coverage area while its shape is completely preserved. Now, again, this is yet another great advantage of our horns. By using the down tilt, you can dynamically improve the noise conditions and, and by simply setting up the down tilt based on the first customer throughput requirements. Now, this way, the antenna only delivers and receives the signal from as far as necessary. Here we can see an example of how to use the down tilt. So if your customers are clustered closer to the site and competitors further, um, set the down tilt such that the MCS zone you want to provide your customers covers only your CPEs. This will help you avoid the interference sources from, or the interference that will be otherwise collected from the competitive CPEs in this area as much as possible. Now, this principle is actually valid uh, in general, regardless of you know, whether they're competitive, where, where the competitive CPEs are. Set the down tilt according to your CPE that is the furthest in the particular sector, and you're good. So if you're wondering how to figure out the down tilt you need to use with the horns to leverage this feature, our link calculator is the, is the right tool for that because it plots the MCS zones directly on the map. So when you, uh, when you adjust the down tilt, it will replot the coverage and you will see how far you actually are covering 
and with what MCS level. So here is the QR code for, for you can actually scan and come back to whenever, whenever you need. We'll put the copy of uh, the recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel and let everyone know once it's, once it's published. And we often get a question of uh, where to buy our products. So on our webpage, there is the stock locator circle in the green, which will bring you to the page where you select the product you're looking for and your region. And you will get the, the, the names and the contacts of the distributors that are nearest to you. Another very common question is, uh, is how do I become a distributor of your product? So on our webpage, all the way down, click the become a distributor link and it will bring you to a, a form um, which you, know, you, you will fill and afterwards we, we will contact you uh, for, with, the, with the further steps. We also have rfila.com, which is a online forum where you can ask your questions or search through the questions that are already asked. And we also put a, a recordings of the webinars there as well, as well as announce our, uh, our participation in the events. And it's really the fastest way to get an answer from us if that's what you're looking for. And we also have a Facebook page RF Elements English, which is a discussion user discussion forum, or RF Elements English, where which you which you can also join, and then the same thing, either ask your questions or search through those uh, that are already there, or maybe share your pictures of the horn installations. So at RF Elements, we um, we really focus on innovation, yeah, and rejecting the noise is really the utmost. Um, uh, utmost problem the WISP industry has and had for, for many years. And our near zero lost WISP board ecosystem actually enables super easy and simple installation and changing of the radio. And the uh, many horn uh, based uh, portfolio of our antennas will actually let you, will let you scale your networks rather indefinitely really because if you can keep adding uh, more and more sectors on a tower or in an area without degrading the performance of the network as a whole then there is really no limit to the scalability of your network and i would also invite you to check our youtube channel and our playlist with traveler and these are five around five minute videos where we interview our customers wisps from all around the world and ask them um, about how, what's their experience with our antennas. So um, obviously it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting uh, thing to listen to if you're a WISP, uh, to see how your fellow colleagues are uh, experiencing or what's their experience uh, with our products and if they actually do what we say they do. Another uh, playlist on, on our YouTube channel is called Inside Wireless. And these are even shorter, uh, snappy videos uh, on all kinds of topics from the world of RF engineering. So whether you're you know, just starting your WISP or are seasoned veteran in the industry, um, might as well check them out, maybe to refresh, maybe learn something new. They're definitely, definitely quite useful, for example, with um, onboarding of the of the new of the new staff if you want uh, them to learn it's different or quite important things or various things from from the practical wisp life quickly and i say we're uh we're done with the webinar today uh, then all that remains is to say thank you for for stopping by and looking forward to any following webinars. You have a good day and enjoy the rest of the week. Bye-bye.